Welcome to the new show, Mark Who's 77. Well, I mean, this is the third episode, but it's still new. Um, I'm Mark Baumgarten, and with me today are Vicky Jakubowski and Ben Collis. Now, Ben, you are the editor-in-chief of the 77 publications. That's right, but I'm just going to tell you, Mark, with any decent comic, when he got to the third issue, the free gift would have come down a little bit in stages. Yeah, so what's our free, <laughs> what's our free bonus? What's our free bonus? cardboard thing by this time. You know, you've had the plastic toy, you've had the mm-hmm. stickers, and now it's like yeah. what we call the survival wallet. Some kind of... Yes, the survival deal. wallet where you change... Yeah. yeah, okay, I remember that. You're okay. Next, <laughs> ne- the next issue, the, the next show we'll do, number four, we'll have you have um, something on the back cover that you had to cut out, basically to face your comic. So we can do something <laughs> about that as well. Okay. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, the gentleman named Andrew Sawyers, who is a artist, comic book artist, known both in the UK and branching out to the United States. He works with uh, Ben on the 77. Ben, do you want to do an introduction? Yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with Andrew Sawyers for three years now. Um, he's been a stalwart with us. He's done several strips. At the moment, he's going to be completing Silver Jubilee. Um, and he previously did The Cell with Bambos Giorgio. Um, he's a go-to guy. Absolutely. Full of energy, full of ideas, uh, unique drawing style. Um, he'll, be, he'll be showing us some of his work later. And he's just a fabulous, fabulous person as well. Really looking forward to chatting to him tonight. Well, we're looking forward to chatting to him, too, and we're letting the audience, I hope you believe you're looking forward to it, to see and hear what Andrew has to say. And now, let's introduce the man himself, Andrew Sawyer. Welcome, Andy. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Very well. Uh, sun's shining. Um, I'm busy at the drawing board. I've got a day off uh, and uh, not long back from Lawless. So, uh, yeah, in good spirits. And uh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. You know, you just brought up Lawless. Let's talk Lawless. Uh, how did it go? Uh, in a word, absolutely excellent. Uh, it's very well organized. Um, absolutely fantastic staffing. And the attendees are probably some of the best in the UK. Uh, they're real diehard uh, enthusiasts, not just the British comics, but the whole comics in general. Um, it's a great venue. Uh, Bristol's a lovely location, and um, despite being very busy, it's a it's a real tough one because you've you've got to have your work head on. But it was a it's still a highly enjoyable event to do. So Andrew, we uh, started with that question, but really we should have started with the question we ask everybody at the beginning of Mark who's seventy seven. It is a question that's probably the hardest question we're going to ask you. <laughs> Who is Andrew Sawyer's? Um, uh, Andy Sawyers, me, is uh, a, 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 just a regular guy um, <laughs> who I think it all comes back to 2008 to coin a mm-hmm. phrase. Um, I, I remember very specifically in 1981, uh, Prog 236, and as soon as I saw that Bolland cover, the uh, McMahon interiors, um, like all children, I was already drawing, but it, it, it inspired me on that sort of uh, descent into comics <laughs> and then obviously you know despite sort of ducking out for 25 years which is a long story um yeah i've, I've always sort of um been into 2018 but yeah i'm um i'm a sort of a part-time illustrator um and uh you know a family man and uh just just really enjoyed being able to contribute to the medium um um, I think that probably sort of sums me up pretty well. <laughs> I, I absolutely love to draw. Um, Excellent. It's great that I've been able to turn it into a vocation uh, to a degree, but um, I would draw or illustrate for pleasure regardless. Um, it's very, very uh, cathartic. And um, I enjoy the fact it brings other people uh, reward, whatever you do. Um, it's mind-blowing to see people take such... Uh, great enjoyment from it um, and I feel very lucky um, you know obviously the 77 have been a huge part of that um, and it's an incredible incredible opportunity it's been non-stop for the last three years since I returned to art to illustrate it. What comics did you read while growing up? What did you so, love? Predominantly 2000 AD okay, uh, 
but then this is where it gets interesting is because I, I was already picking up before the Brit British invasion um, happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see the European influence on 2000 AD artists. So sort of like the whole, uh, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but the band Destiny kind of thing, heavy metal uh, or metal hurlant. You could see that back influence in 2000 AD. And then I could also see... Um, a lot of American artists, they weren't um, lifting directly from 2000 AD, but you could see American comics getting darker. And I, I think particularly around the, the latter years of senior school, um, stuff like The Killing Joke came out, The Watchmen, oh, yeah. Yeah. and um, Frank Miller's Dark Knight. And that's when I really started to sort of uh, pay attention to American comics. Um, so between that and the British Invasion... But for me, it was really uh, things like Daredevil, mm -hmm. um, Batman, um, uh, some weird stuff. Um, I know he's a European artist, but Gru by Sergio. Oh, Aragon. I love Gru. I used to yeah. I used to collect that. Oh yeah. And then sort of jumping off that because it was syndicated, Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. Yep. Um, and then you start to explore the greats, you know, like your, your Kirby's, uh, your Ditko's. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of my influences cited Kirby and Ditko. So you go back to that classic stuff. Um, anything by Chris Claremont, Alan Davis. I know Alan <laughs> Davis is one of our own, but um, Chris Claremont and Alan, Alan Davis together are just indefeatable. Um, Barry Windsor Smith, um, anything like that. And um, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll sort of pretty much read anything if it's well written and well drawn. I'm there. Um, I tell you, I've got to say this though, and this is was um precipitated my departure from art and comics. That whole early, the early image wizard stuff, um, yeah, it killed it for me. Um, and I took a, a real big step back from comics. Um, right. yeah, Vicky. Well, you already brought up um, Calvin and Hobbes, and uh, as someone who also uh, really enjoyed that, being a former um, bad child myself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of feel um, that we have a few similar influences uh, as a retired headbanger and um, <laughs> punker myself. Um, I know it's hard to believe that now that I'm <laughs> old. Um, <laughs> But, you know, what What was it that something, I mean, it? I understand it, but why would something like, you know, from The Killing Joke to Calvin and Hobbes, how does that connection get met? What was it that really kind of spoke to you? Um, so my, my initial introduction to things like Calvin and Hobbes was, uh, whilst I, I was probably not a, as much of a religious reader as a, a lot of my contemporaries and people I work with, in the UK, we think had things like Bandy, uh, sorry, um, Dandy, the Beano, yeah. Wizard and Chips, and stuff like that. So I, I, I got cartoon, and cartooning is massively part of British culture. Um, newspapers, it was, it's been heavily used in advertising, and I think my immediate connection to Calvin and Hobbes was. Um, this was cartooning at its absolute pinnacle. <laughs> Whilst they were drawing in a cartoon style, much like Alan Davis, if you ask Bill Watterson to draw something, he can draw He can draw a car and you just instantly go, that's the best car. If he draws a dinosaur, it's the best dinosaur. And, and there, was, there was things like um, F-14 Tomcats in it. So whilst Calvin as a character is actually quite adult, you know, some of the things yes. he said... <laughs> quite profound um there was lots to sort of draw in a young mind you know the image i mean there was the whole thing when he they used to do stories where he was a detective but it turned out it, he hadn't done his homework and he'd, he'd been put in detention or something um <laughs> it, it 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 just appealed to my sense of humor um Andy, can yeah. i ask you mate where did you where did you find calvin and Hobbes? because I got to be honest with you. That passed me by completely. Was it a newspaper you were reading, or your parents was, were reading, or something? Um, and I'm not embarrassed to say, but uh, like a lot of grandparents, they were quite middle class, and it was syndicated in the in the uh, Daily Express. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't even know that. Uh, 
but um, I didn't. Yeah, it was probably the uh, the crowning glory of, of the only good thing the Daily Express. Sort of <laughs> <did>. <laughs> Andy, no, you're, you're you're hitting you're hitting the nail on the head there. Not about the politics of a newspaper, but the yeah. the purpose and function that the funnies have. And, and I've always had so peanuts, you know, Charlie Brown, um, Trudeau, you know, Doonesbury, whatever. You, uh, we, we have Steve Bell's if in this country and it's biting satire. But as a kid, I remember coming across those when I was 10, 11 years old, not understanding necessarily all the politics, but really liking the drawings and the caricatures, you know. So I'm glad you mentioned Steve Bell's if is absolutely magical. And um, I was very lucky. My history teacher and my geography teacher were. They were very young teachers, and I think they saw the drawings. I used to hand in essays, and they would have almost – I'd not seen Steve Bell, but I used to do almost little political characters. Um, I remember doing an essay on the Gaza Strip and all the oh, stuff wow. in the 50s, and I drew – on the maps, there was all like American generals and probably not quite correct Saudi Arabians and, and things like that, and um, – my geography and history teacher, they, they, they were blown away because they were like, have you read The Observer, which was a very uh, intelligent, well-written newspaper? And I said, no. And they showed me Steve Bell's stuff. I'm glad Ben mentioned that because he's, a, if you haven't checked him out, check out Steve. It's incredible stuff. And I think you can buy it collectively. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. And the referencing you get from reading those stories, it, it, it certainly gives you the names and the characters. So we'd have Casper Weinberger. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know Casper <laughs> Weinberger. But Steve Bell clearly was understanding. He was either Secretary of, of, of State for Defense, was he? Or, or yeah. I, don't know I think he was called. Secretary. Was he Secretary of Defense? Um, I think so. Oh my gosh! Not sure. The thing is, you know, before you before you start reading the front pages of the newspaper as a kid, you're you're trawling the you're trawling mm -hmm. the back page. Yeah, aren't you? definitely. Just, oh, yeah. just 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 quickly though, going but just just to sort of wrap up, Calvin. Um, we were also very lucky, and this is something that was uh, two things that were really instrumental into me getting into sort of like the bigger world of comics was. Said Sun uh, newspaper had a Sunday edition and it came with a very glossy magazine with the production value. I don't think would be affordable these days to give it away. And you used to get full color one sheet Calvin and Hobbes specials in the back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but it was better yet. Whoever their art editor was deserves a medal because um, despite the, the newspaper's political viewpoint, um, they would run articles with people like Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. These were 16 page, they, the, the photographers went round to their studios, mm -hmm. you could see them in their houses, you, you got to see stuff on the drawing boards. And I remember they did the same for um, a lot of films and you got to see um, sort of like um, all the design work and stuff. We used to collect these as children, and I wish I still had them because um, there's no entire issue dedicated to uh, Jim Henson's uh, Labyrinth. Oh, wow. Dark Crystal. Oh. Um, they did the Dick <laughs> Trace. Um, it was all there. And, you know, to be around your grandparents' house on a Sunday, but then to get front-loaded with this stuff that mm. there was – it's not like television yeah. where, oh, there's a, an afternoon special on the making of, or you can go on YouTube and see it all. These were very specific windows in time. And, it, I, yeah, I, I, I'll treasure those forever. I mean, that's right. Those those opportunities you got to pour over some pictures and think not just how is it done. You do it yourself yeah. and have a go at doing it because it's not moving. It's not going to disappear after five minutes. And and, and it kind of it, it impounds on me is the fact that we're in, a, we're in a society now where fewer and fewer newspaper or newsprint opportunities exist. Yes for this stuff to be disseminated, however it is across any any kind of, you know, type of newspaper. But we're losing all of our, I don't know about you guys in the States, but we're losing our community newspapers, you know, the yes, local newspapers. Yes, we are too. Yeah. But there yeah there's a handful of major companies that own most of the newspapers in the United States. And, and I've noticed um, over the last 20 years, the local newspaper has gotten thinner and thinner and thinner. I don't even know if you could do a birdcage with it anymore. Mm. And um, But that's so true when I think about some of the things that I saw growing up in the 70s mm. and the 80s and the different quality of work and the different things that inspired me mm. that the only yeah. reason my son got exposed to that was because I gave him 
stuff or I had it around the house or, um, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking as you were describing it, the only thing I get that is tangible that is is that detailed or anything else there's a quarterly magazine that comes out uh for the d23 club which is a disney club and it is a thick book it is gorgeous it is filled with pictures and drawings and you don't see that quality anymore so how are the next generation supposed to be inspired if if it's not out there you know i i have Ben seen my massive collection of movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's one thing. And you're right, it's fleeting. You watch it. But then I, I like to get, we call them in the States, um, coffee books, coffee table books. Coffee table books, books. Yeah. And I've got books on the art of a variety of movies and shows because it shows the concept art, like of Star Wars and Star Trek and all these things that you just don't get today. And um, um, I am not an artist. Thank God my son has my <laughs> has talent. I have zero. Um, and it, it just I'm so thankful that I was able to expose him because there's nothing out there. You know, yeah. and if we didn't have things like the 77 um, mm. with these because uh, my son's stealing my copies. Um, mm. <laughs> there's, another, Vicky, there's another whole there's another whole genre that's just totally disappeared as well. The music press. Yes. You know, there was there were four newspaper style periodicals in the UK. Melody mm-hmm. Maker Sounds, NME and NME. Uh, Andy, I forgot the fourth one maybe. Maybe you you you'll recall them, but you know, these were proper proper newspaper size things yeah. and they came out weekly and they would all have strips in and obviously artists doing feature work on it. I mean, Andy does album art and stuff, but you know, People have to start somewhere, don't they? I mean, Alan Moore started off in Sounds, I think, with the name of, I can't remember the name of the cat, the little cat cartoon cat, Maxwell the Cat, I believe it was. Right. Sound was very generous and kind to the comic community. Um, In fact, it was funny where comics in the UK would turn up. Ben might know this. I remember arguing with my dad, going, please go to the newspaper uh, shop on a Sunday uh, and he goes, oh, I'm not, I'm not getting that newspaper. But it had uh, Glenn Fabry. Both were written by Pat Mills, I believe. Or one was written by Pat Mills, but Scarther and the Brendan McCarthy. I think Pete Milligan wrote the other one, Ben. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Sounds used to do a lot uh, for comics, particularly um, uh, if it was relevant or pertinent to sort of music fans. Not just because they're like the the... the Comics were a really big thing in the in the UK for, for, during the nineteen eighties. They, they were just you couldn't uh, you you were tripping over the damn things. It was literally the <laughs> comics. And then that kind everywhere. of branch out, didn't we? Uh, or blended hybrid of, for example, music with music with uh, comic, which was Deadline. Um, yeah. And, oh. and, and, yeah, which was pretty much moving that thing on. It, it featured bands. It featured pretty cool kind of, you know, <coughs> pardon me, um, fashion items as well. But had a backbone of, 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 of art by the names that Andy's just mentioned. But you see, that just fits in with what I grew up with. Um, in the 80s, I was living in Hawaii, and um, our favorite comic book shop was called Jellies. And <laughs> yep, yep. it had everything. It had um, um, uh, LPs. It had comic books. It had strange films. I got my first copy of Rocky Horror Picture Show in Korean from there. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it just it, it was kind of like we were all like-minded people and even if we didn't all like the exact same genre we we kind of had kindred spirits and it just made it so you know it made sense it was all together because i'm a huge uh lover of music and movies and comic books and books and to me it all fits I don't see that crossover as often anymore. And I feel like I I was amazed to see Andy, your LP artwork, because I feel like that is a lost art. Well, right. So there's, there's, there's everything you've said, uh, the story behind all of those uh, is basically encapsulated in what you've said. So the latest one, which has, 
being plastered all over New York. And as he tours through the East Coast, uh, I know he's done Massachusetts. I mean, that's not quite East Coast, but it, he's, I know he's Pennsylvania. But Paris Mayhew, Paris Mayhew, uh, for the, one of the founding members of the Cro-Mags, um, the Age of Quarrel album with the, with the big nuclear explosion. Um, Harley Flanagan, who was in the press recently for uh, a very nasty fight at a New York hardcore show. Um, but anyway, Paris was one of the founding members of uh, the Chromax, and uh, I'd come back to artwork. I don't think I'd even been in the '77, and uh, like a lot of people on social media, instead of add- adding family members, I just went for all my favourite music heroes, and I quietly sat on the sidelines because Paris has got some pretty strict rules. If you mess about, uh, you'll find out. <laughs> and, um, it turns out he, the whole New York hard scene were reading those very stark black and white 2008 E strips. Oh, wow. And that was, and, and that, so that was 1982. That was roughly around the same year. I was a lot, I'm a lot younger than Paris. Um, <laughs> but, um, well, not much younger than him, but he was like sort of 15 at the time and I was like five. Uh, that's a distance. That's, that's a distance. But, so whilst they're sort of developing their hardcore punk bands, they you you will see them in Judge Death, Nemesis T-shirts, Dread T-shirts, and his words to me was, y- uh, y- "Your stuff's like that 2000 AD stuff that we used to get back in the day. I want my album artwork to have that vibe." Oh. Uh, yeah, so it all, it is, it's, I've got to give Paris props because um, he's just finished directing the uh, City of the Dead with Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Yeah. And it just goes to show how small the world is. Yeah. But 20, 30 years ago, I was holding those LPs, and you're just like, these guys are a million miles away. And now it shrinks right down. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's all interlinked. We had a previous <laughs> show, um, Andy, with um, Mike Collins. And we were discussing how during COVID, the midst of all of that, we'd actually commissioned him to do how many other strips it is for the 77. And that he's forged a really good writing, um, well, a, a creative relationship with Michael Powell, who we would have met last week yeah. at, at Lawless. But, you know, probably even 10, 15 years ago, that might not have happened because there just weren't those opportunities. You had to be introduced. It was all that kind of thing. And nowadays you get to see experienced people's work much, you know, not not easily, but it's just you can contact them and it's a kind of a, all the avenues are open. So I I, I totally agree with that. It, 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 I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ben, because this came up on the, um, the This Is Haunted uh, panel. Is the comics industry had a glass ceiling. Um, mm. yeah. Not my favourite phrase, but positions as writers, art, artists, editors. Yeah. It was Dead Man's Shoes, and it was its own insular community. Um, independent publishing, Kickstarters, uh, I'm certainly not against the phrase independent comics, um, although I think people sometimes draw an inference that it's a lesser entity, mm-hmm. but the hard work that Ben's put in with his editorial team and the groundwork laid by other independent publishers has completely broken the mould, um, and the underground is now becoming the mainstream. Yeah. Um, and like Ben said, some of the people uh, that I've been fortunate to be published alongside, not just in the 77, but in other, other publications. I think Ben's quite right. Pre-lockdown, um, the pre-pandemic, um, this wouldn't have happened. Um, so it's, it's an incredible, incredible privilege and an opportunity. And I think it's been capitalised on, but it's been very healthy for the comic book industry. It's bringing comic books back. And I think uh, I'll fly the flag for the 77 here. Um, for its price tag, that's a lot of comic book. Yes. Uh, yeah. Really keen on seeing happening is comics should be cheap. They should be good quality, but I would like to see the cover price getting cheaper or as as close to the bone you can take it. So people, when they walk past it, they're, they're like, two ninety nine. that thing's a Bible. I'm going to buy it anyway. Um, yeah. Sort of bring that kind of mentality back. Vicky? No, I, I have to agree with that because I think about um, even when, so when I was a kid, um, 
uh, comic books at your corner store, I would buy them on military bases. I grew up military and, and um, you know, they were not quite pennies, but they were cheap. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was a great, easy way to get entertainment for very little money. It was open to everybody. I think that's one of the things that's nice about comic books in general is that they're kind of there for everybody and there's something there for everybody. And, um, you you know, my older brother and I, um, my younger siblings, not so much, but my older brother and I just were really into, oh, this looks interesting. This looks interesting. And moving around a lot and being all over the country, um, getting access to comic books that we might not have gotten because this is of course, before things were global, but, um, I just I think it would be so nice for some kid to walk by a newsstand or whatever the heck we call them these days and uh, (laughs) and go, ooh, I can afford that. I've got my allowance in my pocket. Let me go and try something new. And I just I I wish that that I, I hope that this resurgence we're having in comic books and in so many other things for as bad as the pandemic was there is a silver lining to all this. I noticed it in my day job. I've noticed in some of my side projects that there's this like whole new way of doing things. This whole new, um, oh, we can do this now or we can try this now. People suddenly became open to trying new things. So I'm just excited because I'm hoping that 2023, which I know we're halfway through, um, but if it continues the way it is, I see so many good things happening over the horizon. What what we're able to afford to do, because we have really good people who back our creators and get the comic off the ground. Um, When we go and we do in-person shows, I did a charity show um, at a a fundraiser a few weeks ago. um, And when we do the shows anyway, basically you're seeing the, you're seeing your, the, the people coming by, you're chatting to them about what they like, and we can almost match them now for various titles. We've got a new one that we're just working on at the moment anyway. For younger readers, is something I'm planning as well. Um, but I think when you're in person, you can have that discussion. We discount our books at that point. Unfortunately, we can't necessarily discount them at the Kickstarter end. Mm. It, it, it's almost like paying forward. We've got a whole bunch of people who kind of pay forward for a whole bunch yeah. of other people to come along um, because, you know, it's unfortunate, but production costs are only going one way. Um, and I wish right. that we could produce comics for pennies. I really do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, the fact is that we we, we, we we have a sensibility about us, which means we want to share things. So we're always doing on our, on our, on our pages and our social media opportunities that people can get, you know, half price comics. They can get free digital downloads, you know, for sure. That, 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 that that's, that's got phenomenal. Yeah. You know, if, if we need more companies to have the sensibility that, that you do, I mean, not only do you do this amazing product, but then, um, you know, you do your best, you do the Kickstarters, you get as much money as you can, and then you try to work. Um, I'm on the local ballet um, board here in Reno, and we do that where we give uh, to the Boys and Girls Club and Big Brothers Big Sisters, which are two huge um, American charities. We give free tickets to expose kids to the arts that might not otherwise get an opportunity. So it, it just, I, I love hearing stories like that because now, of course, you already know how much I love the 77 <laughs> publications. I have a few of them. Um, I may have all of them now. Um <laughs> I've got them all. Woo-hoo. But um, it, it just, I think more people need to be exposed to it. Mm. Um, not only the superior product that you guys do, but just the artistic side of it. The the stories, the, the prospects, the, I want to inspire the next generation into going that, you know, when when you and I are long gone, someone else will be taking up the mantle of the 77 publications and continuing this dream. That would be just heavenly. I mean, from, from my point of view, and this isn't my show, I get Andy's our guest. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of feel I kind of feel as a commissioning editor and obviously, you know, meeting meeting new creators and stuff, it's yeah. where we've gone and what we've got in the time that we've got, I think really means good things will happen, you know 
in the same time that we've just been scrabbling around you know now we're kind of <laughs> i mean andy will tell you that the show he went to he knows that the, the company uh, sponsored it you know he was on a panel he gets invited to shows you know um opportunities are there for all the guys if they want to be able to kind of maximize on that we've got other people who were just like you know in for it doing a bit of a quiet life like doing some writing like doing some drawing <laughs> but if you're wholehearted about it and 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 and, and i very much like people like that um you yeah. know you know we're all steering together to try and kind of you know just just get out there as much as we can if as, as much yeah. as we can sustain as well so um i mean andy would say as well i don't know um how many other titles are you working on at the moment mate you've got you've got several other projects on at the go uh, Ooh, yes yeah I, I think the thing is is uh, uh, there's, there's a there's a two twofold <laughs> <laughs> parts of this question so, so ben i've got to pay ben a compliment um we don't butt heads but i've got to pay massive respect to ben um he's got a vision and whilst that perhaps doesn't always align with my vision and i'm a big mouth and <laughs> but you need a strong captain and i think ben has has built a house that's that's just going to grow. And I think what the, probably the one thing, if, if I ever walked away from comics would be that I genuinely do believe Ben and the, the team that involved with him have created something that has an enduring legacy. And I think it, 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 it'll be funny. We will look back and go, Oh, do you remember what this used to be? <laughs> <laughs> it was done in people's bedrooms. And, you know, I used to draw on backs of cardboard and, uh, <laughs> And the thing is, I think we get frustrated and we get impatient because you want everything to happen now. Right. Uh, but when you look at it in a very, I don't think we're even three years yet, the things that have been achieved, the sheer volume of work um, yeah. is incredible. And it's it's given people that were, were perhaps considering walking away from comics a new lease of life. Um, or they were in the twilight part of the, their careers, and then they've suddenly sort of just gone, well, these crazy kids, you know, to hell with it. Let's jump in and, uh, <laughs> you know, get involved in the party. It's reignite their passion for it. Ben just doesn't stop, neither does Steve and Joe and Dave and, and, and other people that have been involved. Or you. In you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, drop. we can you tell drop. that you're how drawing many, this entire time. How many time. live, exactly, how many live sessions do you do, mate? You can be there, night or day. I love <laughs> it. I love it. Yeah, basically, I get being on my messenger. Sawyer's yeah. is live. It's brilliant. <laughs> at, least, at least once a day. I, I think that, that that's the good thing about technology, and I've seen a lot of contemporaries and people I really admire. They put the time in with, with the readers or the people that support them. And I think it's you just feel duty bound to just give everything back to them, and if that inspires them to start doing it, and if they, yeah, it's it's um, it's good. But in, in answer to your other question, um, I, I think you're just going to see this. Just it, well, it all comes back to lawless. Um, it, it, it is completely reignited. I think there's a groundswell for all of this coming back. And it's, I think it will eventually go beyond past us. It will just become its own thing again. Um, I think we're going to see a real return to the, to the, it will be new and exciting, but you, like you said, passing on that legacy to, to the younger generation, it will inspire them to take up the mantle. Um, and I, I think that's, what's vital about what we're doing now, particularly with the 77. Um, and uh, yeah, it's exciting times. Question: How did you two meet, and uh, you end up drawing for the seventy-seven? Uh, got to pay the compliment to to Ben. He'd seen my stuff online uh, off the back of a competition to do with another podcast, and <laughs> um, in true Ben fashion, if he sees something and he wants it. He'll go and ask, and he literally. You can tell him what him. it was. It's um, is it Droptober you were doing? That's right. And you just said, uh, "Do you want to work with Bambos?" And mm. we've got a strip lined up uh, for issue two. In fact, you originally approached me. I was meant to do the Tingling Triangles with <laughs> McMahon, 
and I just couldn't get it done in time. Um, and he went, don't panic. I've got something else for you. Mm. And me and Bambos went onto the cell. So, you know, Ben just was literally, I'm going to put this guy in print. Uh, ben made it happen. Bambos is a, is a legend, isn't he? He's been, yeah. he's got a 40 year um, career behind him. He's done all sorts of horror work. He's done all sorts of different, different top, top draw um, strips and, and stories. Yeah, no, he's, he's, and he's, just an absolute sweetheart. He's a lovely guy. So, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, but it, so it's all down to Ben. Um, but that was the other thing you asked me, what else am I working on? I've got stuff coming up for Unit 666. Um, for, I've got some more music stuff coming up. Um, Ravenous for This Is Haunted. Mm-hmm. Uh, a of... Um, the seventy-seven. That's basically. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, what about for Corkwood books? Is it? Um, I, yeah, I've got another cover coming out from them, but um, I don't know what else is in the pipelines with those guys. No, you were supposed <laughs> to say you did do a great job on. Um, what's the what's what's our what's our, our Lupine friend? The the hair, hardcore, uh, hardcore. That, oh well, uh, yes. There's more El Benito. Um, there's quite a lot of Calvin and Hobbes in that because um, it's quite cartoony. But yeah, the uh, the rabbits from outer space that everyone thinks are rabbits, but they're not. Yes. They're uh, uh, they're like a, a dictatorship from outer space, but they're mm-hmm. uh, their their plan to conquer the Earth has been yeah brought to a, a halt. We'll definitely put up some illustrations there. What we'll do, Andrew, yeah. at both points, we're going to put some illustrations up. And I want to. Oh yeah. I don't know if these guys have seen the gun toting, cigar chewing, El Benito. Oh yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Benito, absolutely <laughs> fantastic. And that's a creation of um, the character design is sort of you and obviously Joe Healy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I, I, I think it's weird. I, I, it, me and the kids, uh, me and my good lady, um, and I think we've all. I think we just do it as people. Um, we talk about our pets. We talk about our love of um, all these weird and wonderful animals. Um, it's like at the moment. I think the big craze is watching videos of uh, capybaras um, just lounging around in hot water, surrounded by lemons and apples. I, I, and I, I think it sort of grew out of all of that stuff. And then Joe was kind of like, uh, so I want you to do my rabbit in like a Napoleon costume. Mm. I went, nah, what you really want is your, your rabbit in a, in space armor dropping out of a drop ship. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds and, so much better. <laughs> and she saw it and she was like, we've got to do a strip. So I was like, okay. And um, <laughs> I, I put something together and, she had sort of plotted it off the back of a conversation. And I was very fortunate because um, there's nothing wrong with being a girl's comic or a, a comic aimed at a female audience. I actually knew what Joe was getting at. That there was just another genre of British comics. And I think in, uh, perhaps in, in, no pun intended, in lieu of Lou Stringer doing something for Pandora, um, it added a bit of brevity to what was quite a heavy emotional uh comic mm. uh, proper grown up mature stuff in there um and it sort of took the edge off towards the end but um that it was great to, that's a special book and to be a part of that was was wonderful um but yeah space the space rabbits will be back <laughs> and there'll be uh other creatures which you'll recognize but they're also aliens um and they yeah, you've certainly done a wide range of different styles, of it? not the styles of strips as well, haven't you? You're given quite a few different genres to work on. Yeah, I, I think, so my original plan was to go into like advertising and of course everyone wants to draw, say, Batman. But if you, <laughs> most failed comic book artists end up in advertising. So I was just like, well, I'll just go straight to advertising. <laughs> so when I was studying, you you, you try and embrace a variety of styles whether it's or, 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 or disciplines whether it's painting or pencils or, or whatever to meet the demands of of, of, of advertising um, or illustration because um, if you're working for a newspaper for example they might we need a watercolor of something like a landscape so that's what you go and do that day um, 
So I think there's always been that uh, mentality that you need to be very flexible and open to to uh, change your style to fit the brief. I have to say that in in some of the variety I've seen of your artwork, there is one thing that seems to underline all of it. You have a very kinetic feel. There, there's, your, your images have a lot of motion to them or have a lot of, you know, sometimes things can feel very flat in 2D. Yours feels like there is a motion to it. I think that's part, that's the 2000 AD in me. The other part actually comes down to my art teacher at um, senior school. I don't want to see these little brush strokes. I don't want to see <laughs> every line. Get that brush. And if you're painting the hair, you can always cut it back afterwards, right across the page. Ooh. And I, I, I think more so than ever, I, I was always aware of it, but since returning to art, you can really be literally carving away at the page and then you just keep working on top of it until you get it roughly to where you want to. I think half the time the energy comes from the fact that I haven't actually finished it. Um, I get bored. <laughs> um, and then going back to the music thing as well, it's, it, it's the punk rock in me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't be note perfect. It's more about the performance, the energy. Um, I don't think people are standing there checking to see if Vinny Stigma's playing in the right key or hitting the right note. They want to see him doing all like so. Whilst the rest of the band, the band are taking it seriously, you've got Vinny in the background messing around, and he's having he's always having fun. Um, so yeah, it's that hardcore punk attitude. Just, 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 just. just it's about the show, you know. Just put that yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, You're a big suicidal tendencies fan, aren't you, mate? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I think uh, I, I wish I could. If I got, if I could get into a time machine right now, um, I would grab Ben and go. You need to come with me back to 1987. Uh, funnily enough, it comes back to, to 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 art. I was at senior school drawing. And um, I certainly wasn't an introvert because I had my friends, but I wasn't particularly interested in getting more friends. And this kid kept bugging me about my artwork. And he said, look, and I said, in the end, I'll just give you all this original artwork. And he gave me a load of tapes. And I said, I don't listen to music. Uh, my parents have music on. I've got no interest in it, no need for it. And he's like, you've got to listen to these guys. And I looked at them and I'm like, oh, they wear regular clothes aside from the bandana. Uh, <laughs> and they weren't singing about Dungeons and Dragons. It was all about um, <laughs> skateboarding, which is something me and Ben connect on. Mm -hmm. And um, just growing up. Um, and Venice Beach. Been there a few times. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been once. I, I loved it. But um, uh, South London wasn't a, t t a million miles away from kind of like the same problems of um, urban life is, it's a unique thing and uh, yeah. it comes with its own social injustices and suicidal tendencies sang about writing those injustices. And I, I think that educationally for me, yeah. it, was, it was about being truthful and, um, you know, being good to people, taking care of family, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I dug them a lot, and uh, yeah, and they also I, I love the bandanas. So I'm a big suicidal fan. So. <laughs> but I think I think that goes with a lot of the same culture things that we like: be it art, comics, books, films. I'm not saying it's about putting them right, the, the social injustices. At least first of all, recognizing they exist. Yeah, it is a thing. It's a thing for people. Just because yes. you may not have it in your life doesn't mean it's not a thing for other people. You know, yeah. and I think that opens your mind. And then you go, OK, maybe I do need to consider that other people have different experiences rather than just having this whole single single eye direction. You know, there's, there's a true. big myth, by the way, guys. That And it's and I don't think and I'm not here to put anyone down, but there's this big myth that Americans don't hold passports and don't travel. Well, they don't um, necessarily I, need to. They don't need no. to because they can travel across the country and they're going to see a lot of different in their country, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you only have to go on some in some some states. 
one side of the state to the other, and it's a completely different world. And Texas takes know, two I, I days to get through. I've driven it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, we're very lucky, you know, we're, 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 our land mass is quite small. We can go to different countries within mm-hmm. a few hundred miles. You know, we're quite fortunate for that. You can get on a bus, you can drive around Europe for, you know, a few pounds. You know, it's not expensive at all. Um, but I'm not for I'm not for one going, oh, you know, people people who, who live in a huge country and only travel around there aren't as, aren't as you know, educated. I don't think that's, that's right at all. But... I think the thing is that's probably because I've listened to that type of music. <laughs> it tells me that you know. I haven't lived on one side of the country to the other and been to three yeah. or in three other countries other than the U.S. I can say that you know it very much helped shape. You know, having lived in what we call the original thirteen colonies, and then moving across the country, moving to the last state. I lived in Hawaii for several years. And coming back to the mainland and going all over, you you get interesting perspectives that staying at home never gets you. And um, I, I think it's kind of why I have some of the same sensibilities because lived in, actually, I live in the smallest town I've ever lived in before. Uh, the place I live now only has half a million people. It's the smallest place I've ever lived. And it took me many years to get used to. <laughs> but it just... Um, you know, getting out there and seeing everything and being exposed to everything probably explains a lot about me and some of my interesting tastes. And they call me eclectic, but I think that I may make other eclectic people feel weird. So, <laughs> no, and that's a good. That's a good thing. That, yes, that, that is being suicidal. Yeah. Well, I knew I was in trouble when my son's first grade teacher asked me why his favorite band was the Ramones. So. Why not? <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> you know, it's like I raised my son with very interesting, strange, you know, it's like it, I, my, perfect example. My father loved Elvis. My mother listened to Motown. My parents are from Detroit. Um, my mother's older sister got me into Shakespeare. That's why that was my first degree. And um you know, and I got exposed to classical music and I grew up Catholic. So I got exposed to all that. And then of course I grew up in the seventies and the eighties. So, you know, I have this weird, strange, eclectical mix of music and movies. Um, and I just thought everyone did that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a, a magical moment. Uh, my youngest is, she's only eight. Um, but over breakfast, she told me that at school they're studying uh, A Midsummer's Night's Dream. Um, and she's telling me all about the characters. And I'm just sitting there absolutely marvelling, going, so... <laughs> you, you create this little bean, and that little bean's now telling me about Shakespeare. And I just thought, Got it, isn't a marvellous place? Isn't the world a marvellous place? Yes. Yeah. Um, That's I funny. So. I was trying to. I've had to Google this, Andy. So, so I was trying to do this whole quote about you know um, a reader reads a thousand will live a thousand lives, where somebody yeah. doesn't read but only live one. And I'm thinking, was it Primo Levi? Was it was it Saul Bellow? No, 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 no. It's 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 it's, it's George R. R. Martin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that whole notion that that by by reading by engrossing yourselves in other things. You, you see the world in different ways, don't you? Even as a yeah. easy with a guy with a with a donkey face, you know, as in yes. Midsummer Night's Dream, you know. So, that is uh, right. You got it. You got punk. <laughs> you got it. You got punk. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, I think Shakespeare was the original punk. I think he was he a was. punk too. Got it, mate. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you realize how many of our turns or phrases go back to that, and I named my son after Shakespeare. He tells everyone I named him after William Shatner. <laughs> um, <laughs> He, he he's he's like his father he's into tech and and everything he's not into shakespeare he could care less but um, it it just there's so many things and i i did several productions uh when i was younger and still on the stage and i mean there were just so many things in it the the, the intrigue the there are so many movies and stories that we can trace back to his stories and um and there's some really awful things that happen. 
we were talking about um, uh, the Little Mermaid and Denmark, and and I referred back to Hamlet. You know, everyone dies. <laughs> you know, must be you're Danish. Everyone dies. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so it just. You know, you could never get away with a movie today where everyone dies. Nobody likes that. Someone has to live at the end. Yeah, that's that's something I'm really worried about. <laughs> is a lot of stuff coming out that adheres to a very safe, formulaic uh -huh. process. The, the the hero. I'm not saying like let's make everything dark and no, but a little more reality. Dark. Yeah, it's um. It's very easy to guess plot lines, particularly in films. Yeah. At the moment, but I'm very excited because there's a lot of new films coming out. Um, I, I hope it's good, but there's a film coming out called The Creator. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe a film with that budget and that level of effects, really good effects, like you can't tell they're not effects other than we, we haven't made robots that big, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, but you're sitting there going... If that was on the news, I'd be terrified. Um, and I'm like, well, that, that's interesting because everything comes from a, a, a property or it's a reboot. But I, I think we were on the cusp of seeing in cinema a new generation of um, yeah. completely from the ground up originally. You know, because like when we were growing up, we had like Labyrinth, um, The mm -hmm. Dark Crystal. Yes, Indiana Jones was based on uh, the, like the old 1950s style serials and things but like that. But it still was was very yeah, yeah. fresh at the time. But even when, in, what was also good about those films, yes, the hero won, but it came at a cost. It wasn't this sort of, yes. yeah, they walk away completely scratch free. You know, he'd maybe lost someone or there was really been taken to the edge. Um yeah, there's, there's there's a lot of safe stuff out there at the moment, but we'll see. I think these exciting times. So yeah, no, I completely agree. There's a time and a place for that, but I don't like it if I'm watching a movie and I know in ten minutes how it's going to end. Yeah, I want to be surprised, and maybe because I grew up military, or you know, I've now been around a while. I've seen a little bit of death and destruction in life, <laughs> so. I, it's okay for reality. It's okay when, um, you, you know, Alfred Hitchcock would kill important actors off in the first five minutes of a movie. I want to see that again. I, I, I want to be surprised. I want to see a little bit of reality. You know, yes, movies are an escapism. Comic books are an escapism. But I want some of that grittiness. It can't yeah. always be flowers and unicorns. I, I think we had some of that with, with, with Game of Thrones. I think that was, you know, he, he, he surprised us, didn't he? The writer, he kind of, every now and again, something would happen and we go, oh, that person has, that's it. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> but Andy, um, your work appears quite regularly in our titles, back and front end. Because, um, of course, we had an animated sequence done of some of the early work from the comic. And... Uh, I think your work really lends itself to that. I, I, I don't know if you've ever considered the sort of notion of maybe trying to work on a on a on a on a sequential. I mean, a, you know, four, four dimensional terms. I don't know if that's anything you've ever thought about doing animated work. Uh, I think I, so. I, I feel really bad because um, I, I know, for for example, you're far more tech savvy uh, than I am. Um, I think that's one of the. I think that's where we're really lucky. All of the seventy-seven sort of staff and editorial. There's a lot of stuff that gets done behind the scenes that puts we us. We know in bed. people, mate, don't we? We've got friends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to admit, though, I'm really behind the times with a lot of um, technology and IT, and I think at some point I'm going to have to invest. Um, I think the other thing is there's a fear of I end up discovering another medium. And it takes me away from the actual okay. drafting of just getting your hands dirty with ink. But um, I, I think it, it, it may have to come because um, the world is changing. And I think the demands for a slightly more polished product are more evident today than they've ever been. I can tell been. you, mate, when I interviewed your AI avatar, they're, they're up for it, mate. They're, they're going to do this. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Exactly. The AI version of Andy Sawyer's, yeah, he'll be much better. <laughs> um, yeah, 
Um, I just don't. Yeah, what do you I, think I, about that, mate? What's your opinions? It's, it's, you know, we weren't going to ask this as a question, but what do you think about AI? What's your, what's your take on it? Uh, it, it <laughs> thing is, it's going to happen. It's already happened. Yeah. Uh, I'm non. I don't know why, and I feel lucky that it's gone this way. People are divided in two camps, and I've seen some AI. I've, I'm sitting on these um, somewhere on my phone. I've got four lovely, really dark rich colored Aztec paintings and as soon as I saw them I'm like these are amazing I sent it to my friend and he goes yeah they're nice but you know that's AI because <laughs> he's already seen the article <laughs> uh, right, okay um well I still like them um I don't like this war of attrition between those that have learned to draw or can draw and then people that are using AI to create these wonderful images going oh, I, I don't know why I'm like we should all be. It's, it, 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 there was probably similar argue, arguments between guitar players who have spent months and months, if not years, learning how to play a guitar, and then some guy rocks up with a keyboard and with a press of two buttons has just done right. his whole. Thing. I think this is a, a time immemorial question, and it's it, 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 it'll, it'll develop into something else further down the line. Um, I just think going back to what we was all talking about earlier on. Um, the whole world is a special place. Humans are special. We should cherish our ability to, to actually create ourselves rather than just pushing everything else off, off, off onto a machine. Um, you're killing the human experience. That's my only concern. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think we'll be all right. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, so I know that some of your work has been published in America. Uh, what do you think the difference is between the U.S. and the British uh, comic industry? I think I, I would actually put comics in America as as one of the jewels in America's crown. And I think even today with changes in attitudes and what's fashionable, um, America still has a great love affair with comic books. Sadly, yeah. Yeah. sadly in the UK, it's almost been boiled down to the diehards. There are still lots of new people coming into the industry, lots of new people still reading comics, but it's not the powerhouse it used to be. It, it used to be, uh, you know, maybe the, the empire has fallen and, you know, we've, we've had our time in the sun, but there was a time, particularly during the 80s, if we put out a comic, we could do no wrong. It was just absolute pound for pound sheer heavyweight stuff um i don't think it's a simple case of money or finances but uh american comic books still have a huge draw um i, I think one of the things probably not the most well-known comic although every comic book fan knows it love and rockets 40 yeah. years on still going strong and it's just as good as it was when it started um yeah, I think that's the big difference is America never fell out of love with comics. Um, besides, you've got big old blue. Um, yeah, Superman will carry, yeah. carry a long time. Yeah, you're, you're exactly. We've got the Ravens in the Tower of London. You've got Superman. You know? Yeah, if, uh, if Superman when, the Ravens <laughs> leave the Tower, when the Ravens leave the Tower, that's the end of us. Oh, that's you've it. Got, that's the end of everything. <laughs> when Soups leaves, exactly. It's the same, isn't it? No, very yeah, well said, well said. I can't so. believe exactly. I mean, it's, it's strange to think, isn't it? But I mean, the guy's been flying around for what? 18... 1938. Yeah. 1938. There was a time before Superman. Can you imagine? <laughs> there <laughs> no. was. Are you sure? I didn't know that. Thank you for informing <laughs> me. I really appreciate you letting me know this. <laughs> I, I think. Do you know what? He's, I, I could do it. I'm not the biggest Superman in. In the world, but I do love him. But there's so you can about judge him. an artist against their Superman. Come on, Frank Quietly's, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, another Frank, big, big Frank. I love his work. 
um, you know, Miller. Yeah. Um, but all the names, all the st- all the big names. If you if you you want to you want to know what they're like, you just ask them. To do, you ask them to do. You see their Superman, don't you? And you go, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's a new twist on it. That's a new a new way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't read. I didn't grow up reading Superman. I've got to admit. In um, fact, some of the earliest Superman I would have read was the stuff that I bought, which was Dark Knight, really. And I was already by that time I was twenty. You know, it's. Yeah. See, I, I grew up on George Reeves, the TV show. Yeah. And my mother was a huge George Reeves fan. And so I used to um, um, watch that in in uh, syndication form. And just, I, you know, it became a thing. And then Christopher Reeves came out. And of course, my mother took me immediately yeah, to go see right. that. We weren't, lucky, we weren't lucky enough <laughs> to have that syndicated TV show. Yeah. Um, Right. Superman. They said Superman. You'll believe Superman can fly when 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 Christopher Reeves flew. And and I went to the cinema yeah. as a young kid. And it was everything that was great and slightly more uplifting than some of the other sort of sci-fi at the time, wasn't it? So um, yeah, definitely. I there was read, something about that. I read uh, Superman. Well, I'd seen the TV show. I'd seen the movie serials, and of course the Christopher Reeve movie. But in 1986, I got into Superman full time. With the uh, John Byrne revamp, John Byrne revamp, yeah. uh, and then it continued into Ordway and Roger Stern, and it just—I loved Superman. I had every issue of any Superman comic, any Superman appearance from 1986 to like 2003. Yeah, and then I sold it and got barely any money for it. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I lost a big ton of money, but I love the character. I, I love to jump. So what John Byrne did for Superman, um, I think was great. I, I just don't think he went far enough. Um, a lot of what he did was just cleaning up continuity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very soft reset without treading on people's toes. But um, it was around that time, John Byrne all became as, as good as a writer uh, as he did, as he was an artist, yeah. and I was hoping he would take he would take the character further, not change him, but he would be far uh, braver with his writing strokes. And I was surprised how safe he kept it with with a lot of that stuff. But it, yeah. it was yeah. was good. It was good. But um, uh, I think probably the most Superman thing I've ever seen was. Um, so Zack Snyder brought back Superman, the Man of Steel. Oh. But hang on, hang on. <laughs> the most Superman thing about that was there was a beautiful shot of uh, Martha Kent hanging up the washing. Right. And you could barely see it because the, the, the sunset was so strong. And you don't see his head, but you see a very young Clark Kent standing in the foreground, and he's got a red kitchen towel around his shoulders. And they used hmm. ever so slight, um, uh, what's the word, an interpolation of the original theme song. Right. And I think it's little things like that that truly encapsulate Superman. The, the rest yeah. of the film, average. Oh, but, I, yeah. I hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it. I, uh, and, and people are going to hate me for this. I did not like uh, the Superman uh, that they did. I did not like the uh batman justice league i kind of got into it but i i'm not sure what the big deal about and i'm gonna get killed here Zack snyder is i don't actually know because he made everything so dark i mean superman is fighting zod in metro metropolis and knocking down all these buildings that po- probably are have people in them and there's like superman doesn't seem to make any big deal about it he's just gung-ho on fighting zod they made it so dark yeah. There are bits and pieces I like about those films. Mm-hmm. But, and I'm not the biggest um, Zach fan. I dislike him for a couple of different reasons. And it just, you know, I get trying to push the envelope, get trying to do something new. But it's just like, you know, if you ever do a character that has been done a million times before, whether it's, you know, Tennessee Williams or Shakespeare. You can take it to certain areas, but you can't leave the character behind. And as much as we'd like to see Superman do different things, there are certain things at the core of Superman that have been there since the beginning. 
And yeah. you, you, it just, it makes it really hard that you just, he can never be the dark knight. You could take Batman to the dark knight, but you can't take Superman quite there because there is a feeling about Superman. I mean, he's as American as apple pie, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and there's this, just, there's this, and, and I think, I'm glad you said that because uh, let's say apple and apple pie had had a was sentient. They really would. <laughs> they really, they really, okay they, that. they really would be happy and all about bringing people happiness and making sure yeah. everyone's okay. So ergo, I think Superman really is like apple pie. And I think kind of Zach, I'm not defending Zach because I think that there's a lot of those movies, but I think he kind of tried to address that when Superman, uh, Batman tried to take uh, Clark to task. It's like, so you come down here and you're getting upset because I've broken a few arms and knocked a few teeth out. And there's a few people that have been maimed and scarred as cause and consequence of my actions. Well, listen here, kid, this is the reality of what we do. Um, I'm not happy about it, but what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Uh, you're moaning at me because I'm a vigilante and I've broken a few arms. You killed tens of thousands of people in a battle with yeah. another alien. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you brought war to our planet. And I think the sort of the rot sort of sat in with um, the Superman character. I think if I was to do a character like that, maybe you would have this little almost little angel on <laughs> Superman's uh-huh. shoulder where it's his not his the ghost of his dad but his conscience saying to him yeah fuck you, you can't run around doing this um you, if you was to flick someone in the head you'll you'll snap their neck yeah you're, really, you're gonna have to th- isn't, isn't that why andy when we grew up reading dread we we liked dread not liked him but we liked the strip because he also he always had to come back to the law yeah. To quote Step Brothers, Ben, did we just become best friends? Because funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly Those are cushions. <laughs> yeah, exactly why I love Judge Dredd. He's, he's, he's not evil, but even when he does bad things or makes the wrong decision, it was always written into the strip. Even if it wasn't Dredd understanding the consequences of it, there was always that perspective. There yeah. are ramifications and consequences. No action it was very real world if you do this this happens it was all yeah. cause effect and i think that was the bigger lure with dread is um he can't have his cake and eat it um I, I, do you know what i think it's possibly the if if we was to look at the character from a, a writer's point of view probably the only reason he's psychologically still standing is he's bereft a lot of human traits and emotions uh, he's starting to get it as he gets older and softer and um but i think most normal people your mind would melt with some of the things he's had to do uh, yeah um yeah well i mean judge dread is supposed to be dark superman's supposed to be light it's not supposed to be dark I, yeah, not light I, but not definitely not you know, killing I everybody. I think Superman dark. can go to the edge of the envelope. He just right, can't but he can't pass it, and it just seemed like in that. And there's plenty of other characters it. that can give us that, and I think that's again exactly. one of the reasons that I've enjoyed so many different characters and so many different comic books is because you know sometimes I need that rule breaker, sometimes I need that straight and narrow. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I need that emotional tug. Sometimes, you know, I just want to see something blow up. You know, <laughs> that's my catharsis today. I must watch something explode. Um, and you almost need that pantheon of characters so that you can enjoy the different aspects. Because we're not one dimensional. We're, we're, you know, most humans have a variety of emotions and need different things at different times you know i'm a very different person now than i was in the 70s or even the 80s and you know um 
although I still enjoy some of the same things, I, I ha- I'm a little more complex than I was when I was younger. And now I need something a little more complex. Well, if I want that, there's a variety of options I have to read or watch. And I probably would always have a problem with Superman getting too dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think I'd, 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 Mark, that is, I think that's a beautiful assessment. I don't think I would want to see Superman become dark. No. I mean, but he's he's come dark in the comic a few times, but it's always there's always been um, a reason behind it. Right. And yeah, but it's but like Calvin, and and, and Superman's not not as I mean I know we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah that's okay I love uh, Calvin. Uh, I'll take I'll take but, that comparison and throw in a couple of no there's there, as a reader you sit there knowing at some point he's going to go have to go down the Christopher Robin route and mm-hmm. accept there is a bigger adult world out there. Um, yeah. But no, I, I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't like him to become sort of like a, a darker edged anti-hero. Um, right. But it, it's funny, even some of the, the greatest minds of our planets who are good people and had humanity's best interests at heart, have had to make some sort of nasty decisions. And I think that must be tough for someone or, or yeah. a character like Superman. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I th- I, yeah he's, a, he's a legend. He's fantastic. And it's great to see him endure to this day. Okay, okay. how do your kids feel about your art? <laughs> you got a couple of kids. What do they think about what daddy does? My oldest likes it. There's a couple of things that have come out. Um, funnily enough, the, the comic book for the box set for the uh, death metal band, she doesn't listen to that music. She listens to nice music. Uh, but I, I think don't know. Was, that might be nice music sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But, um, she was just genuinely blown away that something had come out that had such a profile um, that really ended up all over the, uh, the internet. Um, my youngest is very creative. So, I think she looks at it from the point of view of, so how did you do that? And how do you get that oh, effect? Cool. And sort of what materials, um, I, we just dug out today. I, I found an old folder of some really old artwork. And the reason I dug it out was I knew it had sheets and sheets of letter set, the, uh, the letters that you, people used to use it to make flyers and stuff. That's what I used it for. I used to make flyers for bands back in the, uh, the mid nineties. And you'd use Letraset to get it all looking slick and professional. Um, and then you could use Whiteout to do a, an outline where it crossed over the, the black artwork and stuff. And um, so she's been playing with that today. Um, but yeah, yeah, they like it, but they're not. Um, it, it, this came up in conversation earlier on. It's uh, I was talking to a guy earlier on, and, it, and it's funny, people are... are they're just absolutely indifferent to it. They're not. They're not. They're not that. Um, they're not that fussed. It's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. Well, I think we're running down on time. I'm going to final questions, and Vicky always has to think about it. So Ben, <laughs> it's not a question. It's an observation, Andrew. You haven't mm-hmm. been sketching while you've been on the show. Have he you? totally has. He's been he sketching has. the entire Let's time. See his hand. Because <laughs> Let's see on it. Let's Facebook, see it. Oh, there is oh. a live. Oh. Exactly. Oh. There we go. Whoa. Keep it up there for just a second more. Put it back oh, up. Yeah, put, yeah, put, it back up. Back, put it back up. Wow. Wow. That is I'm, really I'm nice. Off. I'm in he's, been, he's been two timing us. He's also been doing <laughs> a live drawing thing as well. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can't, no, stop, uh, you can't you can't stop the man from doing it. To be honest <laughs> with you. I told you everything about him. He's dynamic. He's hardworking. He's doing it all the time. It's brilliant. Uh, That's yeah. why I love him. That's why I love him. He does it heart and soul. I, what did he, I, I think that that that's but that sums up the seventy seven. Um, we, we're lucky to have such an incredible team. Um, yeah, it is team, isn't it, mate? We really do. I and mean, we don't just emphasize it. We know it. We met up at the weekend and it was just like, we got a team photo and it is just total team, isn't it? Me, you, Richmond, uh, yeah. Stopford, Joe, Dave, Steve, 
and anyone else who who finds us is just brilliant. Yeah, it was, and it was it was great to meet Aid Hughes as well. What a lovely, Aid, lovely man. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, that that whole weekend not long enough. Um, no, I know it was some people. It was great. Thousand. Well, we'll do it all again at um, London Film and Comic Con, won't we, mate? In a few weeks. Yeah. Um, that be it's funny actually. There's lots of people asking me about that. Um, I think that'd be a big success for us. Nice one, mate. But, um, yeah. yeah, Vicky. Well, how would you feel if, um, you know, in in ten years' time, some new comic book artist comes up and tells you how much you influence them? Could you imagine that? Uh, I can't imagine it. Um, mm -hmm. There have there have been uh, already some people that um, have been inspired to reignite their passion for art, having seen me do it. Um, it's something I try and get into every conversation. Is uh, you you can all do this. This is not exclusive to. A particular set of individuals but no, I think if someone ever said um, so I, I do comics because of your stuff I, I think then all of the pain sweat tears blood um, would be worth it and it would be, a, yeah. be an honor um, yeah but then uh, I've caught myself saying that to I've been lucky to meet uh, particularly in the last three years a lot of my heroes and I think oh. my opening gambit is I'm doing what I do now uh, because of what you guys were doing 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, to, to say to Mike McMahon and Dave Gibbons mm. and, and contemporaries like that, um, your work, and I know they struggled in the early days, you've, you've put a lot of people on the path to, to making comics. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. I, I, I think some of those people are whilst they have massive fan bases, are hugely underrated, are hugely underrated. Yes. Uh, and their contributions to popular culture uh, is massively underestimated. Um, I'll, I'll throw some names out there. There's a, a lot of good second-generation 2000 AD artists that are working in the film industry, and they're massively shaping um, a lot. Of, you can see the 2000 AD influence in a lot of... Uh, films that's all come from the, their heroes which are the same as mine Mike mm -hmm. McMahon Carlos Esquira um, all of that you know Mike McMahon won't have it that he influenced the new uh, Star Wars film well I'm like well Jock worked on the new Star Wars film and he's your biggest fan or one of your biggest fans so yeah, yeah it, everything comes back to 2008 so yeah that's what they say <laughs> that's what they say there's a whole yeah. website scene and a podcast Everything <laughs> comes back to 2000. I wonder what show that they, is. Did they dare you to say but, that, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> As John would say, don't you dare talk about those evil people. <laughs> no, no, fine. But one of them may even appear on the show at some point. So it's ah, absolutely so, fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, we've touched a little about this, but I want to ask, what uh, are your future plans for... Uh, your comic books what do you have in your future coming up um so more el benito for joe um she's slowly but surely gearing up the next pandora um mm -hmm. and i promised her fully painted uh all the bells whistles um and trinkets of a fully painted alien rabbit comic Ooh. strip um if for anyone that's interested, um, all of that artwork will be, those pages will be on the Kickstarter. Oh, excellent! Because yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I really want Pandora. Oh, I wonder what I'll be doing. Um, <laughs> I, I really want Pandora to be a refresh, a refresh, refresh. She'll be going. <laughs> um, we'll try and time the Kickstarter so Robert Cox is at, is at work and that'll give everyone else a chance. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, he's a good friend of mine. Um, but Ravenous with Dave Healy, um, just to sort of quickly touch back on that, um, it's basically John Wick meets Near Dark. Oh. Um, 
so that that's very much a going concern um i think we'd, we're wrapping up silver jubilee for the 77 but mm -hmm. um i'm sure something else will come round. um the, the, you know there's lots happening with the 77 all of it good um but at some point after jubilee what are you doing, I'll be... um, what are you doing in the annual what, what are you doing there mate well, I think Steve's preparing his A game to sort of put the leash on me to make sure I don't do go too crazy. Uh, I want to tell you the story that we're doing, but there are very strong plans that I'm supposed to be working on um, V. I think AID's going to work on the cell. I don't know. I know you two were scheming over the weekend. You would go off into a corner, little quiet, little quiet chats, and then I. I turn up and you'd stop talking. It like, yeah, hey, he, he just keeps coming up with these huge list of rules of don't put this in it and don't do that and <laughs> don't, don't make it too gory. Um, be mindful this has got to go on the shelves of, of some large chains. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, You also I, hand them out to school, school libraries as well, mate. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm that guy that does the stuff that when you go into the school library and you find that one book that's got past right. the teeth. Yeah, I'm that guy. So. Cool guys. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, and I, uh, I'm working on my own project at the moment. Um, it, it's going to take a lot of heavy lifting. Um, uh, there were some really crappy films that I used to like as a kid. Uh, the, the Prophecy series with Christopher Walken. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've always loved that heaven and hell kind of war on earth kind of thing. Yeah. But I thought, wouldn't it be funny if, or well, not funny, but interesting twist <laughs> is that the demons and the devil, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, they're the good guys. And then like heaven, Ooh. they're like, they're more like the government, like the CIA. They're just... Yeah. Oh, I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. Um, but then the weird thing is, one of the angels, who's a very nasty piece of work, she has to go find out the top demon guy and say, I, I actually need you to help me save the planet because the big boss has gone too far this time. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like, like kind of like how Crowley in Supernatural was, he was okay. meant to be the king of hell, but. Yeah. Yeah, he likes Sam and Dean too much. So, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> nah. And I think that's about it. But um, lots of band stuff coming up. More stuff from Memoriam. Um, and I think at some point they'll be looking to have uh, a sequel to the Rise to Power comic that was in their box set. So, yeah. Um, yeah, more war stuff. Um, that was very caveman-like. It was just tanks and helicopters and jets. <laughs> I tell you, that was that was mostly inspired by Bill Watterson. Um, I'm, oh, okay. I know exactly. Everything which, comes which back. One, yes. to, okay. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly which ones you're talking about. Yeah, in between looking at Cam Kennedy's stuff, um, the Light and Darkness War, all the other books I had on my drawing table doing that death metal comic was was Bill Watterson, uh, the Lazy Sunday book and Attack. Mm -hmm. of Snow Goons and Revenge of the Babysitter. Mm -hmm. um, I actually own them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I can't walk past a shop if I see one going cheap. Like you go past like a, mm -hmm. a store and you right. see it, you've got to rescue it. So Absolutely. Um, <laughs> sometimes leave them on train seats if I've got like a spare copy. Ooh. Someone to find. Introduce a new set. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it's good. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, about it. That's about it. Well, we're going to go, but I'm going to thank you in just a second. Ben, go through some housekeeping. What's uh, people can find the 77? Uh, what Kickstarters are running right now? Okay, okay. So the Kickstarters, we've got the lifeboat, Ian Gibson's lifeboat. That finishes the 8th of, uh, hang on a second, the 18th of June. It's doing very well. Uh, keep an eye out for that. There's the Imagination of Ian Gibson on Facebook group. The other 77 publication title that we're working with is with um, Big John Wagner um, mm. producing his The Bogeyman, 
the incomplete case files. Pleasure to work with him on that. That finishes in July, so a few weeks off yet. You can find us. Our own shop is the 77 comic.net. Go to Facebook for our socials, the 77, big group, lots of chats. And we have the 77 to 2000 AD for any retro 2000 AD stuff that we spend a lot of time talking tonight about as well. And Andy's all over those as well. And you'll see his exclusive artwork and offers through there as well. I'm sure he'll tell you about Familia as well. Thank you. Um, if you're looking for our podcast, we have, Mar yes, this is Mark Who 77, but we also have a radio show and podcast called Mark Who 42. We can be heard weekly and a few repeats throughout the week. Uh, listen to us on Subspace Radio Network, which is www.subspace.radio, or you can find extended versions of our radio show. Go to markwho42.com. It's all there. Um, and now that I got that out of the way, I want to thank Andy uh, Sawyers for coming on the show. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, I do, I've been listening to the show for, for a while now. So, <laughs> the, uh, and you still came on anyway. And you still came on, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's a great show. It's got a lot of heart. It's, 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 a, it's a warm hearted show. Um, long may it continue. Uh, I think you guys are great. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and speaking of uh, our radio show and the 77 together, Ben, we have a show coming up. I don't. It's not next week. It's the week after with a certain writer and artist. Yeah, John Wagner, Robin Smith. Um, absolutely, we'll be talking about the Bogeyman. And um, I think as we go week by week, we can drop the other exclusive guests that we've got. We'll be discussing that as well. Okay. Thank you all for listening to and watching Mark Who 77. Uh, we're going to be on. You're already watching it, so you know we're already on the YouTube channel for Bum 77 publications we're going to be doing a show it'll come out i don't know uh weekly or bi-weekly uh ben yeah yeah okay <laughs> it could come out in a year no it'll be before a year keep a watch out on the 77 publications uh youtube channel for that we'll also be publishing links to that in facebook and twitter and i know there are other social media uh platforms out there but can't go everywhere. Wherever we can fit it in. Wherever, you know, we could. I, I have an Instagram for the show. I'll start putting in there. Uh, okay. Except, did you notice that on Instagram, you can actually do a link? I mean, you can do a link, but it just, it just writes it out. It doesn't have a way to push it. Yeah, you can do a link in the bio. But I've right. noticed what a lot of people are doing now is, because um, it only allows you to put a singular link, is they use Linktree. Oh, yeah. And, okay. Yeah. That's the only way around it. Um, I think, actually, in defense of uh, Instagram, the only reason they don't let you put links in the post is mm -hmm. um, unscrupulous individuals that will just put links everywhere. Right. Right. Spamming other people's posts with links. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, it will become Linkstagram. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> More links than photos and videos on Instagram. Yeah. You've got to have fun with your dinner, and you've got to have photos of your kids. <laughs> All right, or, or photos of you <laughs> your dinner. So whichever, whatever you're into. So okay. So again, I want to thank Andy Sawyer's for coming on the show, Vicky Jakubowski, and Ben Collis for being my co-hosts. I'm Mark Baumgarten. Until next time. Uh, oh, oh, one last thing I have to do. I'm doing it. I want to thank Lestat for doing our uh, title sequence. Uh, we're going to be mentioning him a lot because. He does, you know, it's his, his title sequence, so why not give him credit where credit's due? Uh, ben, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I say something about staying lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you go for it. Go for it, Ben. As Mark would say, <laughs> would say, stay lucky until next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you.